I think that when we think about satisfaction, it's important to differentiate satisfaction into two different areas, the process of care and the outcome of care. And what we're really going to spend the most time talking today is about the process of care. And basically, process of care has two components to it. It's how we deliver that health care and also how well patients can access that health care system. And we know that both of these things, particularly the delivery and access to care, impacts, impacts patient satisfaction, and it also impacts their perception of treatment outcomes. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of that when we talk about the Eurogyne literature, that what matters to physicians and healthcare providers as far as like a successful outcome is often really different than what matters to the patient. So we really, again, trying to get to that patient-centered level of care. Um, and then each factor that impacts the process of care needs further elucidation, and we need to understand and learn more about that. So most of what we're going to talk about today is how we deliver our health care and how we can make modifications to that delivery of health care that can ultimately impact the outcome of our care. So let's talk a little bit about satisfaction. So this is actually one of my favorite slides in how we define success after reconstructive pelvic surgery. And if you go back to even like the 70s and you start looking at high quality green journal, gray journal publications and how people defined success, for instance, like the initial Birch paper for when John Birch published his outcomes um, of using Cooper's ligament as an attachment site for curing incontinence. Basically, it used to be if the, they would report their outcomes as the patient would have their surgery, they'd come back. And the surgeon would say, oh yeah, the patient, you're, you're, you're much better, no problem. And that was how they defined cure, even in the like peer-reviewed publications. And then they thought, well, it's probably not right for the surgeons to define cure. You know, like we probably should ask the patients what they think. And then there was an evolution to, if the patient said they were fine, um, then we, they got reported as that the, the surgery was successful. And as that happened, we realized that as patients just saying they're cure, if I'm if I'm leaning over and I'm looking at a patient and the patient really likes me, and you know, some of our patients are really sweet and nice, and even if they have a terrible outcome, they don't want to make me feel bad. So we thought, well, probably just what the patient reports isn't okay either. So we went to these really rigid objective findings. And so some of the first studies I published, we were focused on objective definitions of cure. And so a patient could come in for their post-operative follow-up. They would have absolutely no symptoms of urinary incontinence. They had a sling, for example. They said, I've never leaked. I'm so happy. This is amazing. And I would do a full, like a urodynamic test. We used to do post-operative urodynamics on everyone three months after surgery. And I would fill their bladders, not to 300 or 400, like where we fill them now, but I would I would push them and I'd distract them and I'd get like 800 cc's in there, something that they would never walk around in their everyday lives. And if they leaked one drop with really vigorous activity at this non-physiologic bladder capacity, I'd be like, oh my gosh, this sling failed. In contrast, if they had terrible detrusor overactivity at 50 cc's, but they had no stress incontinence, I would be like, oh, well, the sling was a success, even though the patient's outcome was no different because they were still, still leaking. So then we realized, oh, that's probably not the right way to do it. So we went to reporting objective and subjective assessments of the patient's feeling, our patient's outcomes using validated instruments and quality of life, life instruments, like the pelvic floor distress inventory that everyone's so familiar with in our team. And then we realized we're probably not capturing everything with just objective and subjective quality of life and bother measures. And so we started always including some measure of patient satisfaction, just how, how satisfied are you? Which then dropped us down to like most of the time when we look at outcomes after surgery, if you look at most of the outcome literature, there's gonna be some measure of objective and subjective success, a patient satisfaction matter, measure, and then how well patients achieve their own goals. And as we're gonna get into later in this talk, 
personal achievement of patient selected goals may be the thing that drives patient satisfaction the most after surgery. So this graph represents um, how, how do we define success after prolapse surgery? Um, there was a big national trial done called the CARE study in which women having open sacral colpopexy got randomized to, and no stress incontinence symptoms, got randomized to sacral colpopexy plus or minus a BIRCH procedure. This is really similar to the micro study that um, Dr. Gillingham is doing now using minimally invasive sacral colpopexy, although it was done with open sacral colpopexy. So one of the sort of ancillary studies that they did after of, on these data was to look at how should we define success after prolapse surgery. About that time, the National Institutes of Health had convened a expert panel to determine like what is, how should we define success after prolapse surgery? And they said that it probably should be, you know, the pop Q grading system stage zero is perfect support, stage four is complete prolapse, like the complete length of the vagina. And we decided that we should probably define prolapse as stage zero, one or zero or one support. So that's near perfect support. And anyone that didn't have zero or one support would cons be considered a failure after surgery even if they were really happy with their outcome. And so when we looked at the care data, and we if we used a stage zero or one as our cure of prolapse, only about 58% of people having a sacral colpopexy were cured. However, if we used more patient-related relevant definitions, which is no bulge symptom or no prolapse behind the beyond the hymen, which has been consistently shown to be the stage or the degree of prolapse that patients actually acknowledge, cure rates went up to 